Hi there, and welcome to our, I think it's the 11th Octoprint on Air episode. Um, yeah, well, this one is a little bit different than the ones I did in the past, um, uh, because this one actually is not done as a live broadcast. Um, the thing is that, uh, yeah, well, I, I, I don't know why, but this June and also basically the past six weeks or something like that have been insane with concerns to trying to find um, yeah, wait, basically a, a weekend slot uh, for, for doing a live broadcast. And so after much pondering, I decided that it would probably be a better idea to just do a recording during my work week instead of trying to wait for, for some good time on the weekend again to do a broadcast uh, with, with all my patrons. Um, simply because otherwise it would probably take until mid-July or something like that until I finally get, uh, yeah, Get, get the possibility again in my schedule to do that. So I don't know if it's for you this uh, 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 um, if it's if it's as insane as it is for me. <laughs> but currently every weekend is basically blocked. Friends moving, uh, family visits. Um, I had my high school graduation <laughs> reunion a couple of uh, weekends ago. I think two or so. So yeah, I don't know what's up, but I really hope it's over soon because I could use a good weekend again. Well, um, that out of the way, let's get started, I guess. Um, short outline of what we'll be talking about today. It's basically the same that we always do. I'll first tell you uh, about what I've been up to these past couple of weeks since our last um, episode, um, what my next steps will be. And then I'll do uh, the, the, yeah, the Q&A segment with uh, the questions that you, my patrons, sent in. Um, the past uh, couple of weeks, and then a short wrap up. Wrap up, mm, tricky word. Um, also, maybe as a as a small uh, heads up, it's horribly warm in here, and um, yeah. So if if you see me uh, looking a bit red or something, that's probably just because uh, it's way past my comfortable temperature zone, and, and we do not have an AC. So yeah, I hope you 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 will be able to. Um, uh, bear with it. <laughs> All right. So, um, what I've been up to, um, I guess most of you noticed that a couple of weeks ago, three weeks nearly again, I, uh, pushed out 1.33. And then one day after that, immediately I pushed out 1.34. Um, and, uh, the reason for that is that, um, I had, I think it was three reports by users, just like you, who had some weird issues with 1.33 which consisted of that after they started up the server, the Octoprint server again for the first time after the update, um, yeah, so something led to the default printer profile getting corrupted. And if auto connect to the printer was also configured, that then led to a, um, yeah, a full blown startup error causing the server not to start up again. And, um, I was not able to reproduce the, the, uh, corruption issue myself. But um, considering the severity of the problem that these three users encountered and my fear that there would be quite a number more of people who would run into this um, that simply would not tell me, uh, I decided to at least fix the server startup issue that was the consequence of the, of the profile corruption and fix that and, and make sure that the server still would boot up fine and just log, in, log a warning message and... Um, yeah, not not cause any pro problem. So this is what basically went into 134 only 24 hours after 133. I also, of course, did not do any release candidates for 134 because it was a hotfix release and it just had to go out of the door as fast as possible before more people were hit with that problem. So um, as I already said, this is an issue that I could not reproduce myself. So I could manipulate manipulate my um, my default printer profile in such a way that I could trick the startup error. But I, to this day, I have no idea how it happened that the, that the profile got into such a state in the first place. And uh, so if you should have experienced this uh, in the short while that 133 was live and 134 was not out yet, then please get in touch with me. Um, there's also a GitHub uh, issue on that. Um, on that topic that I link in the description below. Um, because, yeah, I I have the feeling that 
the underlying cause is probably still there and I really would like to uh, get it ironed out instead of having it lurking in there and potentially causing uh, hard to debug issues down the road. So yeah, um, also important here and, and something that I, I really want to repeat, although I'm starting to sound a bit like a broken record in that regard. Um, this is an issue that apparently only affected a small handful of people. But if those handful of people or, or people that, that could be affected by it had used the release candidates, we would probably have noticed it before 133 went out of the door and I could have, could, could have fixed the, uh, stuff then instead of doing having to do a hotfix and risking that people run into problems. So just to reiterate, um, if you feel at all comfortable with it, then please, please, please um, um, look, uh, think about uh, potentially, uh, let me quickly just do something here. Um, then, uh, then please think about um, helping me test the release candidates. You can, uh, with, with a couple of clicks, just switch your Octoprint installation to tracking the release candidate channel for the maintenance releases. And then you will get update notifications, uh, like just like you're used to uh, for, for stable releases and just be able to, to one click update to the release candidates. And um, yeah, the more people who do that and um, run new upcoming releases against uh, the, the myriad of uh, printer, controller, firmware, hardware configurations that are out there, that, which I simply cannot do, um, yeah, the, the more likely is it is that uh, certain bugs will pop up before they hit everyone and uh, will and, and it will then allow me to fix them um, and uh, make sure that the release is uh, solid. So um, I thought about maybe just showing you how easy it is to switch to the release channel. So I'm going to do that now. So here's your regular off the mill Octoprint 1.3.4 running on my uh, printer. And uh, yeah, switching is basically as simple as going into settings, scrolling here to software update, clicking the little icon up here, and then switching the Octoprint release channel from stable to maintenance RCs and saving. And this is all. So this will now make sure that if something like an 1.3.5 RC1 comes out, you will get an update notification. It will detect it here. It will show you the usual little notification up there, just like you're used to. And uh, yeah, that it's, it's really as simple as that. And um, you, of course, also can always just switch back again by switching back to stable and saving and then you will be back on stable only releases. Um, what you might want to make sure is reading the link that is um, provided here using release channels, because that also explains all this again, and also what the release channels that are available are, and a bunch of other things with regards to um, information that you should know if you are running uh, something like a maintenance RC channel. But it really is fairly simple and straightforward and not a lot of work on top of what you're usually uh, used to, uh, simply just switching the release channel. All right. So what I also did, of course, uh, the past couple of weeks after I pushed out 134 and also while the release candidate phase for 133 was still going, was um, some first work on, uh, on the 135 release. And um, yeah, so of course, the usual maintenance and, and, and minor improvement stuff uh, that, that goes into every um, maintenance release is also something that I was working on there. So basically what I did so far is I fixed some issues with the GCO viewer that were reported in case of some more or less exotic configurations. Uh, and uh, I also added auto detection for the ANET A8 printers because those keep popping up uh, more and more. And apparently they so far needed some manual work to get going because apparently they're running some kind of a repetitive flavor unless you flash them with this Skynet 3D firmware thingy, which basically is just Marlin with a bunch of stuff added to it. Um, yeah, and in order to prevent users from running into issues there with these printers, 
um, apart from them catching flame, which apparently they sometimes do, but this one I cannot fix. Um, I decided to uh, yeah, quickly add auto detection for them. It was a small change, but I think a lot of you will profit from it. Um, what I also did, and which has been requested a couple of times in the past couple of months since Marlin added this feature, is uh, support um, temperature auto reporting by uh, by the firmware. So so far it was uh, Octoprint. What, what Octoprint did was um, pull the firmware every uh, I think five seconds by default when idle uh, when printing and two seconds when the target temperature is set or something like that, and ask it so. How hot are your hot ends in the bed? How hot are your hot ends in the bed? Basically by sending an M105. And um, the problem with this, of course, is that Octoprint has to constantly do that. And it uh, introduces additional noise on the uh, serial line. And it would actually be nice if uh, such information could be pushed by the firmware instead, instead of the host like Octoprint having to constantly query it. And thankfully, um, something like that got added to Marlin 11 zero, I think, already, but is disabled by default. I hope that that will be fixed in future versions, um, which is um, yeah the, the uh, auto temperature reporting capability. And um, what also got added is uh, a means for um, host software like, Oct like Octoprint to get information from the firmware about its capabilities. So they basically extended the M115 re uh, um, command which so far only told you stuff like uh, which firmware are you running, which version, and if, if you were lucky that actually was meaningful information because sometimes it was just stock values that no one ever bothered to update. But now it will also, if this is enabled, which it isn't by default, sadly, I also hope that will change in future released versions. Um, yeah, that will now also pull out, uh, put out a list of capabilities that are supported which are basically just a list of flags and a true false value or, or some other kind of um, information. Um, and one of those flags is the auto report for temperature stuff. And when Octoprint sees this um, in the capability report parser, it will then switch off the temperature polling. It, it, do, it does usually and rely on the firmware to send its stuff after telling the firmware to please report the temperature to it in I think every two seconds or something. I can't remember the exact logic right now, but something along that line. Um, yeah, and of, of course there were also some more fixes and improvements already. So the, the list is growing and uh, yeah, it's a lot of, lot of stuff already in there. So the work continues. <laughs> Um, one thing that happened is that uh, after I released 134, I got a ticket opened on GitHub and a small number of users are reporting in that that print cancelling with 134 apparently takes noticeably, noticeably longer than with 13.2. Uh, so the problem is that I have not been able to reproduce this myself. So. When I cancel a print, Octoprint immediately stops sending data. And once the printer is done uh, pushing out whatever it was still um, keeping in its buffers, it will stop doing the job and then the print cancellation script will run and everything will be fine. So uh, I could not observe any behavior changes between 13.2 and 1.3.4 in that regard. And uh, I also cannot explain why there would even be a change at all because I did not touch anything related to this in uh, between 132 and 134. So, so far this does not make a lot of sense and I have absolutely no idea. Um, if this is something that people are, are just thinking they are observing or... Um, yeah, it's it's weird because, okay, I mean, there are two two reports, I think, where it showed that the firmware actually took longer to respond to uh, one particular command in the cancel procedure. And yeah, the, the problem is that if the firmware delays its response, then yeah, I can't really do much about it in Octoprint. The same users who experienced this, on the other hand, though, claim that they did not run in this issue in 132 and the firmware was answering instantaneously here. So yeah, currently I am a bit in the dark and I really would like to tackle this for 135 um, if possible at all. Uh, but yeah, as I said, so far I have no reproduction at all and I have also no idea at all how this could even be caused by Octoprint. 
even though it looks like it might be, because if it worked with 132 and it doesn't, or it, delay, it is delayed with 134, yeah, that sounds like Octoprint's update is at fault, but I have no idea how. So if this sounds familiar, you click and cancel and it taking longer than before on 134, then uh, please get in touch. Uh, on the ticket 1946, I'll also put a link to that in the description below and um, provide me with information about your printer model, the firmware you are running, the version of that firmware you are running, and uh, also your octoprint log and a serial log. And um, especially the latter one is very, very important because it's the only thing that I have in order to diagnose um, the timings with which commands are sent by Octoprint and re re responded to from the firmware. Um, so this is something that yeah is absolutely necessary in order to be able to get to the ground of this. Um, if it's even one issue and not multiple ones, I yeah I'm I'm really a bit in the dark about this problem. Yeah, any help certainly is appreciated. All right, um, what I also did and have not published yet, maybe I will have by the time this recording is published, um, is uh, I evaluated the survey I did among the uh, patri patrons uh, with uh, $3 and up regarding uh, priorities of possible 1.4.0 features. Uh, yeah, I'll have to make a post about this in the coming days, finally, and uh, yeah, give you feedback on that. Um, what I also did, but in a way less amount than I was hoping for, uh, is that I did some more work on the new communication layer that is supposed to go into 1.4.0. Um, the problem with this is that it always takes me a long time to wrap my head around that stuff again when I come back come back from work on the maintenance uh, branch and, and uh, all that. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, but currently, so the past, let's say, two, three months, Maintenance and support on this project is nuts. I barely find the time to actually work on new features and I'm just constantly trying to fix fix bugs or rather even more hunt down information with regards to potential bugs and trying to explain uh, why something is not a bug and such uh, and stuff like that. So yeah, I'm sorry for the lack of awesome new uh, reports about implemented features for the upcoming 1.4.0 release. I simply currently don't find the time for that and I really hope that will change again because otherwise I have to think about some way to make it change. All right, so what are the next steps? Um, I already uh, said that uh, yeah, maintenance is probably something that is taking up a huge amount of my time also in the foreseeable future. I call this the usual maintenance madness, and this is not only maintenance of the code base itself, but also all the support stuff that goes around it. So uh, ticket, um, try it, looking into potential bugs, uh, trying to figure out what is up and all that. And uh, yeah, I'll do. I'll work on 1.4.0 um, in in the time that I can squeeze next to that. So, hmm. um, which is actually a good point now to to tell you that this is still an open source project. So if stuff is too slow for you <laughs> um, and you want to help but can't code, this is also no problem because um, all of you um, that are even a tiny bit knowledgeable about Octoprint and most of you that use it are probably way past uh, the required skill set for that is uh, help me with support on the mailing list and on the Google Plus, Google Plus community and also on GitHub, which is not supposed to be used for support, but some people still do it. And um, yeah, it's 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 just such such a huge amount of of text that I have to read all the time in order to try to help people. So if if more of you just jump in and help me with that, that would already probably put a huge burden off my shoulders. And uh, for that, it also helps to subscribe subscribe to the GitHub issue tracker, uh, and and help me with identif identifying duplicate tickets and such. And uh, yeah, basically tickle users into providing. Um, data that is required for analysis. I have a bot in place that tells people, but yeah, sometimes it still does not um, help. And 
having to run after this kind of information is just horrible because it eats so much time constantly trying to remember people to just please provide this and please provide that especially on issues where people respond to with yeah i'm seeing this too but then they do not provide any locks and such and um, yeah any help in that regard just retrieving information from people that is required to uh, troubleshoot that would be also probably very helpful all right now those were the next steps which now brings us to our little q a section um so let's let me let me quickly scroll a bit so okay um the first question is by james and he asks um, thinking at all of having a central control for a farm of octoprint devices have a way to monitor the health and versions of the devices so basically um I, I guess the question here is basically, are there any ways in order to, yeah, to monitor a farm of octoprint, uh, octoprint instances uh, in, in a somewhat centralized manner? And um, so far, um, as, I've, as far as I know, there exist some solutions to do exactly that. I mean, with the API of octoprint, it's, it's fairly trivial to do something like that. Um, so uh, two that I know of is um, R, uh, sorry, R. <laughs> Um, one, one is called printer view, which is a web interface, but apparently that is a, a bit buggy and no longer maintained. Maybe someone uh, who has interest in that kind of thing might want to like, take a look at that and uh, pick up development or something. Um, I'll, I'll link to that in the description below. And uh, the other one is a command line interface that uh, is called Poseidon and is actually uh, developed by one of the E3D, E3D guys. Uh, and I figure probably also used in the printer farm. Um, and I also link to that in the description below. So those are the two that I know of. There might be more that I do not know of. And if you know another option, then please tell me and send me a link because then I will uh, include that in an update or something. Um, or just, yeah, or just do a blog post or something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so far, sadly, apparently the, um, the, the options are a bit limited in that regard. Um, starting with 1.3.0, Octoprint actually contains a JavaScript client library that is supposed to help with developing these kinds of, um, of, of uh, farm monitoring systems. And uh, with 1.3.2, I also made that capable of, multiple, uh, of, of connecting to multiple concurrent instances, making it truly functional for these kind of things. Um, but so far, I also don't know of anyone using that. And uh, yeah, maybe you want to be the first or something like that. Um, what I cannot do is write some solution for something like that myself, because I, I sorry, but I simply lack the time. I understand that uh, quite a number of people are interested in something like uh, farm management and such for the Octoprint instances. But um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, usual, the, the usual maintenance plus the development of Octoprint itself is already eating up more than 100% of my time. And um, I do not want to cut back on that for some new project that I would then also have to maintain and um, uh, take care of. Because I think that would be a bit unfair uh, towards those that do not need such a farm management solution. <laughs> All right. Um, next question, also by James. <laughs> um, any chance of doing a calibration or timing run to dial in the estimates for printing times? Um, so I'm not entirely sure that I understood that fully, um, uh, fully correctly. Um, but as far as I understand it, there is no such thing as something like a dry run or, or something like that that you could do because the only way that you could do it was sending the stuff to the printer and then it had to go through all the moves and this would be the only way you would get reliable print times and then you could also just print it. So um, that being said, the best timing estimate uh, baselines basically you get from past prints of course because if you've already printed something once then you know how long it will probably take if you print it again as long as you do not modify the speeds and all that um, 
And yeah, so this is the best baseline. Uh, and in theory, the data of all past prints is actually also there. And it would be possible to yeah, extract some kind of uh, fudge factor to apply to slice uh, slicing estimates or, or, or yeah, estimates just from a static G-code analysis. Because if you know file X was estimated with two hours uh, before it was printed, but then it actually took 2.25 hours when printed, then you know, okay, you have to add something like 25%, uh, no, not right, an eighth on top of things. Um, and then you will get a, a more or less accurate result. And yeah, so the data to do stuff like that is there. But so far, I sadly have not gotten around to seeing if uh, using that um, would actually yield any, uh, yeah, any positive, um, uh, any positive effects on on the on the time estimation. Um, so technically, um, it would be possible to just extract the data and um, on on every after every successful print, use it um, to to. Uh, adjust the fudge factor that you lock for the for, for the printer profile in question but um, yeah this is a theory and it would be necessary to first test if this theory holds so all the implementation would need to be done and then it might be possible that we figure out that oh it doesn't actually um, yeah it, it doesn't actually improve estimates by that much so what I fear here is that I put a lot of effort in there um, only to realize that I could also just not have done it because it didn't yield anything. So this is something that I would like to play with, but so far I did not have the time for that because it's simply, considering that I do not know about the outcome, it is basically a low priority um, kind of experiment. And uh, yeah, um, considering my current to-do list, it will probably be some time before I get around to do this, um, which doesn't mean though that none of you should maybe experiment with this. So if you're a bit familiar with Python and want to play around with this, be my guest. Um, I would be happy to also lend a hand where I can as time uh, permits. And uh, I would be really interested in, in findings about this stuff. In general though, and I already covered this in Ocroprint uh, on air episode three, um, Print time estimation is a very, very tricky beast because prints are so very, very different from print, uh, model, printed model to printed model and um, and such that, that estimating, estimating that stuff is simply, yeah, as a, 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 doing completely accurate estimates is, is simply impossible. And um, as far as I so far <laughs> uh, found, at least. And... Um, you always have to to find a good balance between investing time and effort to make things better and how much you actually made them better by that. So if I have to invest something like two weeks by uh, for 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 some minor percentage of accuracy imp uh, in increase, this is probably simply not worth the time and effort. And this is the problem that I see myself here. But well, as I said, maybe also tr take a look at Octoprint on air number uh, three for some more info on this. All right, this brings me to the next question, also by James. <laughs> James was really busy. We also had a couple of uh, questions last time already. Um, have you ever thought about a power on default set of instructions? I always turn the thing on, then start preheating the bed and the nozzle to a certain temperature. Um, actually, I have not only thought about a power on default set of instructions, but to a certain degree, have implemented it. I don't know if you saw it, but there's under settings, G-code scripts, there is one that says um, after connect. And uh, these are commands that Octoprint will send to your printer directly after it establishes connect, uh, a connection to it. So um, this is something that you could use if uh, power on in your case equals um, connect and connection to the printer is established. If you need something a bit more sophisticated than that, um, or for example, if you only want to send commands once you actually power up your printer physically via uh, the, the, the was was it M1 uh, M81 or something that that ATX uh, uh, supply command, 
Or if you want to somehow tie it into something like that third party PSU, uh, PSU, oh, how was that plugin called again? <laughs> uh, damn. Uh, well, the PSU control. Ah, once uh, if you want to tie it into something like the PSU control plugin or something like that, um, you would probably need another plugin, and or talk to the developer of the PSU control plugin to, uh, yeah, basically talk them into providing you with some kind of extension point in order to hook into that from another plugin. But um, yeah, I think for the most cases, the AfterConnect script should probably be completely sufficient. Um, I use it to do something like hello from Octoprint uh, to put that on, on the display of the printer, but this is basically just a toy uh, in, in that regard. You could do way more sophisticated stuff. All right. Then the next question by Chris. What new functionality or new roles would you like to see Octoprint to have in five years? Do you foresee a, a day when Octoprint will be good enough or is the feature wish list long and coherent enough to keep going indefinitely? Well, um, to be honest, I never thought about what will be in five years. And uh, about around this time a year ago, I wasn't even sure I'd be able to still work on it today. <laughs> and uh, this is really only possible because of my patrons. So a huge thank you. Uh, to every one of you who's backing me on Patreon and uh, making it possible that I work full t uh, continue to work on Octoprint and even continue to work full-time on Octoprint and really make this my my full uh, focus. Yeah, um, but back to the question where I'd like to th see things go in general is, uh, yeah, I want to have it lean more and more towards a more universal kind of platform with pluggable components. So not only one fixed UI, uh, not not only one fixed communication layer, not stuff like that, modularizing that out basically and allowing it to um, be switched out for something else, depending on whatever workflow or use case you have to cover. And uh, in general, my goal is really just to keep this thing flexible enough to keep up with the market, because um, what we right now uh, are seeing is that re requirements along the board, are, are, they keep shifting. I have no idea what will be in five years with regards to the 3D printing market. I mean, maybe we'll need completely different ways um, to to be able to even uh, even interface with the printers maybe they all will turn proprietary maybe there will be f uh, finally something like an actual well-defined protocol which is something of that would be a dream come true for me um or maybe something like octoprint will be completely yeah obsolete because all printers will be completely intelligent and and, and work out of the box and, and and nothing like that will be necessary anymore even though i could imagine that nothing will ever be as flexible as something that has a, a plug-in interface in place but this is just me so yeah i really have no idea how the world will look like the 3d printing world and, and also the world in general will look like in five years time so what i currently am focusing on mostly and and what will probably also be my focus for the foreseeable future is making stuff flexible enough that it can adapt, which is, I think, the most important thing that you can do in such a shifting uh, environment. Basically, I'm just trying to keep up and adjust as necessary or uh, inspect and adapt, basically. So, um, yeah, maybe as, a, as an additional follow up to a similar question from, I think it was the last episode where I was asked what I what what the big, scary, hairy features would be that I would like to see in Octoprint down the road is um yeah future proofing is is something in general that i have to think about because um some of you might not know but octoprint is written in python 2.7 or is targeting python 2.7 and python uh, 2 point whatever will stop being supported by 2020 so before that happens, I'll have to move over to Python 3, which actually I should have in the very first beginning, but yeah, back then it was just a hobby project and I was certainly not uh, foreseeing the impact it would have on my life and how long I would uh, be going to uh, work on it. I, I don't know if I ever mentioned that here, but 
Uh, I basically coded the very first version up within two weeks uh, of, of, of vacation and after that considered it done <laughs> because it was doing what I needed it to do. And then suddenly it exploded. Um, so back then I sat on Python 2.7 because this is what Cura was using and I was f uh, I, I forked Octoprint off of Cura, even though nothing, uh, not a lot of stuff is, is still left over from then. And um, yeah, and I'm starting to feel a bit the pressure that means that 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 this support will stop in 2020 for this language version. And uh, the problem is that Python 3 is not backward compatible, not not 100 percent. So some some stuff has already been done on Octoprint's code base. And uh, thankfully, uh, someone uh, contributed those changes because, uh, yeah, it's it's it was quite some some work. And this will go into 1.4, but it will not yet, I fear it will not yet be fully compatible to Python 3. And with that will still need some more work that I will also try to push in where I can find the time for that. But in the long term, we will probably need to switch completely to Python 3, uh, which means it will probably be something that sooner or rather than later, I have to target for Octoprint 2.0.0, because this will be a back what's incompatible change, which means I'll have to do it in a major, major version upgrade. Well, and uh, long story short, um, this is something that I need to do before <laughs> the five years um, and ideally before 2019. So yeah, this is going to be fun, not <laughs> anyhow. Um, I hope this answers this question uh, well enough. <laughs> okay. Um, next question by Andre is, uh, I use my 3d printer in my home office next to my dorm room. Some prints take 20 plus hours to finish and the printer noise keeps me sleepless the whole night. It would be nice to schedule non print times where the printer parks the print head on a safe place outside from the print area and starts again when the non print time ends. So all this could in theory already be done by your plugin. Yeah, I, I know I keep saying that um, uh, because uh, with 1.3.0, I added support for some more nifty pause and resume scripting because what Octoprint will now do is record the last print head position uh, on, on pause and allow you to use that in resume scripts. And it will also um, try to uh, to record as much information about the ongoing print as possible. And I think in 1.3.5, I will also add temp the, the last temperatures to that. Um, the only problem is that firmware is not as forthcoming with regards to some info um, as I would like it to be. So some things have to be tracked outside of firmware by Octoprint itself, which makes things tricky when you print from SD, for example. So take that with a grain of salt. But in general, it would be possible to uh, just yeah, have a plug-in automatically, uh, well, basically monitor the time. And when it sees, oh, it's uh, past 11 p.m. and we are still printing, then just pause the print, move the printhead, uh, have it record the print position and stuff, move the printhead to a safe parking position, which you can just define in your in your pause script, and then uh, shut down the uh, the temperatures, all of them, the heaters, the, the heated bed and the hot end, because you certainly do not want filament to cook in, in, in your, in your uh, extruder all, all night. The problem with that is, um, well, first of all, bed adhesion um, is, is, is a concern here because you probably really do want to shut off all the heaters and not leave the bed uh, on all, all night. My, first of all, it costs a lot of money and energy ha having it run all night when nothing is happening. And um, secondly, I don't know about you, but I would feel a bit unsafe. Uh, I, I'm also, on the other hand, I'm also a person who does not print while uh, while asleep. So I actually have never printed anything that uh, ran longer than 15 hours for that reason, simply because I do not trust um, any printer. <laughs> uh, to to not burn my house down while I'm sleeping. So call me uh, yeah, call me, call me a bit easily scared, but it's just my personal uh, approach to things. So if you would, what, would want to shut the heated bed off, which as I said, I would probably, then uh, you might have problems because it cools down and your print pops off and yeah, there you have a ruined print. 
So, um, hmm. you probably want to leave it on and this is a bit, uh, yeah, okay. Um, and the second problem is that, um, is the, the, the stepper positioning. So some firmwares, uh, do disengage the stepper locks after a certain amount of idle time. So they notice that the printer is not moving back and forth and all that. It's just resting at some position. So after something like five minutes, they disengage the, the, the hold, the, the holding force on the, on the steppers. So then you can move the printer by hand and it might also move a tiny bit amount uh, on by itself. And this is of course something that you do not want. Um, on the X and Y axis, you might be able to, um, uh, yeah, to recover the position on resume by just homing those maybe after a little Z lift, um, in order to not hit, hit anything that is on the, on the homing position. But, um, um, the problem with that is that, yeah, you can home X, Y, and after that it will know, the printer will know it's, it's X and Y position again, but it might still be slightly off because the repeat repeatability <laughs> of the homing position is not necessarily 100%. So, um, you might get a really minor shift in there and depending on what you're printing, that might be bad. Um, and this is only X, Y, what you cannot home in order to recover the position is basically Z because you might not have place on your print bed and not be able to home to, to Z zero. So, um, yeah, this is tricky. Um, in most printer designs, the Z axis probably will not move a lot on its own because yeah, with the spindle and screw stuff, um, it's, it's a bit more tricky than uh, the belt driven X, Y axis, but there are also belt driven Z axis. And yeah, I mean, as long as you can, you, you are very sure that it doesn't move on its own a lot when the, the idle, uh, the stepper hold disengages, then you could solve this problem by some nifty resume code that basically resets the Z coordinate, uh, basically by telling the printer, um, by the way, your Z axis is at, I don't know, 20 millimeter or something like that. And then you can continue like that. But yeah, this is a lot of if and, and would be, and maybe, and, um, yeah, if, if this, if all this is really viable and works, it hugely depends on, um, yeah, if you could live with some minor artifacts in your printer on print resume after your, uh, no printing hours or not, because you will probably have them. They might not be very visible, but I fear you will have them. Well, yeah, that would be that. Um, these were five questions and I think we leave it at that for now. Um, usually I would now ask for live, uh, uh, for, for, um, for additional questions from the live chat, but since this is a recording only this time, we do not have a live chat. So, um, I hope it's okay for you if you keep this a bit shorter, because I really have to get the fan back in here, um, before I start to melt. So, um, what we'll do, I think is, uh, I'll just wrap this up now and, um, yeah, basically the next, uh, the next episode will be a broadcast again. I sincerely hope it depends of course a bit on uh, future weekend plans, but, um, I really hope that this insanity of every week and being, uh, scheduled through with stuff that is currently my life <laughs> would stop. Uh, soon and then we will have it in something like four weeks or so so by the mid end of july at least that's the plan <laughs> i hope i can uh, stick to it yeah um so that would be that i think and that only leaves me with um wishing you a pleasant day uh, may all your prints succeed <laughs> and uh, in general happy printing bye <laughs>